Hey everyone, how are you guys doing today? Uh, sorry you saw my lips moving there uh, for a few minutes. So, if you are watching this on the replay, then um, you want to make sure you don't miss these in future. Just click the notifications icon and you should hear, uh, you should see um, an option to click a little bell. If you do that, you'll get a ping whenever there is um, a chance to see these live hangouts in future. And if we do that, then you won't miss them. There we go. So, can you guys hear me now? Okay. Want to be sure? Great. I don't know what's up with the colors here. So, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'm just um, doing a quick live questions and answers. Um, if you've attended these in the past, I hope I got to your questions before. If not, today's a good chance to do it. Uh, might be a little bit less crazy today because I did not schedule this ahead of time. My other live events, I've been telling people via email. So there's a lot of competition to, um, to come and hang out. And um, yeah, I'm seeing all of your questions here. I'm just gonna catch up with how I've been doing with people so far. Um, let me see. So Aeon on YouTube said, thanks for hosting it. Tomas said, uh, over on Facebook said, hello. Um, nice German hello. Felicia, Felicia Spinks said, hola Benny, de Puerto Rico. Oh, I might actually go to Puerto Rico at some stage soon. So now it's not very far from where I am and it's not expensive to get there. So uh, let's see, Eva said hi from the Netherlands. Uh, Tara over on YouTube says hi. And Mala says, salut. Ahmed says hi everyone. Lorna, hello. And then we have the first question from Anneli uh, Bleis, or Bleise, sorry if I'm not saying that right. Um, it says, will you be writing a book for learning Russian? Very specific question here. Uh, so, oh, there's a humming sound in the background. Okay, sorry about that, guys. I'll have to check that out afterwards. Um, so, if uh, you guys know of the language hacking series, we've done four languages so far French, German, Spanish, Italian. We will be doing more languages, and um, I personally don't speak Russian, so I wouldn't be able to. Um, use my own personal examples, but in the languages I don't speak that we're going to be doing that course in, um, you'll be happy to hear I'm going to be collaborating with people who do speak the language. And that's going to be a chance to truly um, use a lot of that content. So we do plan to do various versions in multiple languages, um, and Russian is very likely going to be one of them. I can't confirm a date yet that we would do that. Let me fix this little color thing. It seems to be in and out, there we go. Uh, can't confirm a date yet, but I would like to do a, a Russian version. Um, otherwise, I can recommend Russian resources to you guys. Get this there we go. Better. I can um, share some Russian resources. Uh, James, if um, uh, James is helping me out with the chat here, James, if you could link to our Russian resources um, to uh, over on YouTube, uh, Anneli. Um, then that should help Anneli out with whatever um, it's needed. Okay. Interesting. I can do like an artsy thing here. Okay, uh, so next question is from. I'm just reading through the questions here because I'm catching up with what you guys have been doing. What's up with the colors in this? Oh, I see. I got a little thing here. Okay, I'll just have to leave my mouse there for the moment. All right. Um, so Pepper King says, "Hola, Huckleberry Hamill." As a, a funny second, guys. I'm having a mouse thing happening here. It's giving me a weird look on my face. That should do it. There we go. 
Okay. So, uh, Huckleberry says, What's up? And a big, What's up? Back to, back to you right there. Uh, Alison says, Hola. And Tara says, Do your books come with audio? So, you guys who know the uh, language hacking books, um, it's, a bit, it's a good question. A lot of people wonder, you know, do you get a CD with it? Because the books are like, they're just $15. So usually that's like, um, you don't know if that's enough to cover um, audio with it. But the audio is actually completely free. There's a, an app made by Teach Yourself that you can get that will uh, help you download the audio to listen to offline. So it comes with audio completely free. So um, you'll be able to get that immediately and listen to all the dialogues. Okay, Shannon De uh, Dement or Demont says, "Hey, learning Mandarin over here. Very good." Um, then Gerardo says, "Hola a todos," and hola, I'm right back to you. Okay, Jonathan, a regular visitor to these live hangouts. Jonathan has um, the following question for us. He says, "If you were a two proficient in a foreign language." And next week you're going on a vacation to a country where that language is spoken. How best would you spend that week preparing for the trip? Very good question. So our first complex question of the day here. Um, essentially what I would do is I would try to plan out what is actually going to happen on that trip and be very specific about it. So um, you say it's vacation. So let's say, for instance, um, uh, I like... Uh, if I, if I do go to Costa Rica, I have to confirm it, but it would be to a yoga retreat. And that's uh, be a very nice relaxing thing. So let's say my Spanish was A2, and I knew that I was going to this yoga retreat for one week, and that I wanted to be ready for that, and that it would just be in Spanish. Then I would study specifically vocabulary related to yoga retreats. You know, if I'm going hiking for a week, I would study hiking vocabulary. And I would try to Skype with somebody and have a basic conversation to cover those um, kinds of vocabulary terms that are likely to come up and tailor to that because you know yourself what the vacation is going to entail. A lot of us have plans when we're going to a country. You know where you're going to go, so learn the names of the buildings. If you are going to take pictures of um, like churches and so on, then maybe learn some church vocabulary, some museum vocabulary and try to have those basic exchanges with your uh, with a teacher, Skype somebody before you leave. Ideally, have a Skype session set up for the day before you fly or take a train or whatever it might be and try to pretend like you're a tourist with that person. But if you're an A2 level, you should be able to go a little bit beyond that and try to push it to slightly longer exchanges. So um, learn a little bit about the history maybe um, have the person who you're having a conversation with on Skype ahead of time explain those things to you. Um, that's what I would suggest for preparing for a trip. So I hope that helps, uh, Jonathan. Thanks for the questions as always. Okay, let's see what we got next. Um, so, Shannon from uh, Eurolinguist, she says, what do you do when you feel like no matter what you do, you just can't wrap your head around the language? Not a very uh, interesting question there. No matter what you do, you can't wrap your head around the language. Um, I've, ha I've had a couple of uh, stages in my language learning travels that I feel like I have tried really hard and I, I just, it's not, I'm not getting anywhere. And I have told people in the past that if you are stuck at a plateau, like you are at a particular level, you're not getting anywhere with that then that tells me that your, what you're currently doing doesn't work and you need to change your strategy and do something different. So if you've done speak from day one up to this point and then you're, you're not making any progress, maybe that's when you have to start actually having a traditional studying approach. But um, going beyond that, and you, f you really feel like you can't wrap your head around the language, then you might have to ask yourself, why are you learning the language? And are you, um, are you truly passionate about it? Because I've found, in, for me certainly, languages that I haven't truly, genuinely wanted to learn, I, I feel like I'm not making that much progress or I feel like I've lost that passion. Like I've been so bogged down with all the logistics and the studying and 
um, learning vocabulists that I've forgotten the initial things that inspired me to learn that language. So maybe you need a little reminder to figure out what those things are. Um, and maybe that's, that's what it all is. Maybe you have to kind of investigate more your motivations and your reasons because if you just the, the phrasing you're using you can't wrap your head around it that that kind of sounds more like a, a psychological barrier because otherwise if there's something specific like if you're learning Spanish and you're saying I can't make sentences because I can't conjugate verbs then you know that's the thing that you need to work with work on specifically you can do exercise you can ask a teacher to help you figure sentences like that we can't wrap our head around it maybe a psychological thing that you need to uh, try to kind of think how can I figure that part of it out all right so moving on um, we have Shunsui uh, Kairo, uh, Kairaku um, I probably said that wrong um, over on YouTube saying he watched the Skype song and it was very motivational lol thanks for it you're more than welcome I uh, can gladly tell you guys that I have plans for collaborative videos I have lots of interesting ideas now that I'm I am able to, you can see I'm testing this out, these like interesting graphics and live stuff. I've got some, some cool ideas that I plan to do more collaborative videos um, during, my, uh, during, during this year and during my travels. Um, Corey also liked the Skype song. Um, Matthias, do you recommend exchange programs like F? I don't know what F is. Um, and I don't know what you mean by exchange programs, like if that's an online exchange program or if it's uh, student exchange program. I'm mostly familiar with the Erasmus student exchange program. I also did a um, engineering internship exchange program. That's as you guys, a lot of you guys will already know that I moved to Spain initially to start all my travels. The reason I was in that expat bubble was because I went there on an exchange program, a work exchange program for engineers. And uh, those programs, I do highly recommend them. I think they're very good experiences. You have a lot of support because when you travel um, to a country by yourself, as I well know, because I've done it so often, you might actually not end up learning the language because of all of the logistics involved in just living in a country. All of the confusing things that are taking up a lot of your time, um, you know, logistics and trying to meet people, whereas a program can kind of introduce the people get you doing activities so it depends on the exchange program but i i do think a lot of them are very good okay so bonjour benny from the from the nebraska says uh, cory miller bonjour um shannon uh, uh the other shannon there's two shannons there you got shannon who uh, actually helps us here at uh, uh fluent in three months she runs your linguist but this is a different shannon who says where do I find a good list of most used Mandarin phrases? Hmm. Okay, good question. Uh, so, when it comes to phrases and, and frequency lists in general, this is something that's a little controversial because I've been uh, skeptical of a lot of these, these kind of lists. Because firstly, when you think of word frequency lists, you have to ask yourself, what is the frequency coming from? And generally, it's the printed word, uh, like you can base it off newspapers or maybe uh, published books. And now there's a problem with that because that is based on the written language. Now, if you are studying to understand the written language, those frequency lists are perfect. They're the best way to get to that. Sorry about the sirens. Um, I'm, I actually have this really technical thing. I can't, I'm going to try in my next videos to get rid of these sirens. And, this noise cancelling double microphone thing that the engineer in me can't wait to try out. But today you'll have to hear it. Um, so these uh, like word frequency lists are, are not great if you want to learn the spoken language. Like if you studied word frequency lists for English, you will never find, at least in the top 2000 words, dunno, D-U-N-N-O. But people say that all the time. I don't know, I don't know. So I feel like that should be in a higher frequency list if I was studying spoken English. Uh, so generally what I would do is I use these frequency lists um, when I'm an absolute beginner because I find the, the top 100, they tend to be words like, words like the and that you just gotta know, they're gonna come up regardless. But then um, Shannon specifically asks about phrases 
So I think for phrases, the simplest thing is the Glossica method, especially for Mandarin. Uh, what he has done is he's actually recorded, and he told me this and his team told me this when I was in, um, uh, in Taipei. He has recorded native speakers and he uses his content uh, based on what they would say. So for a particular style of learning, that is actually really good. That's going to give you the truly spoken phrases that people use. And he adds in frequencies to that. So you can get, you can get a lot out of that. I would also, myself, add in a lot of personal things because his, because his lists are based on what natives actually say. The catch is there will never be a phrase in that list that says, I'm Benny, a blogger from Ireland. Because uh, a native Mandarin speaker will never actually say that, obviously. So um, I would try to adjust those lists uh, with that. Okay, so hope that answers your question, Shen. Okay, so... Aeon says, uh, if you're learning a language and you want to read some books, but you get stuck in a rut, so to speak, and your question continues, I'm, I'm kind of losing track of this question, it goes over two points. As far as your level in the language goes, where simple books bore you, but you can't understand intermediate ones, what should you do? Okay, all right, so if you want to read a language and the simple ones are too boring, but the intermediate ones are too complicated, what do you do? Excellent question. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, what kind of simple books? That, that's the first question I would, I would take because uh, generally when we think of simple books for reading a language, we imagine children's books. And I've tried to use children's books and I have gotten a lot of good use out of them. But then again, um, they are not the kind of thing I can, I can get lots of enjoyment of, uh, from over the, the long term. So you can mix things up. You can try to read comic books because the visuals help a lot with that. And there's a lot of uh, quirky stories so I think it holds your attention. Manga as well is a great idea. Um, but uh, what, what I find helps is uh, if you want to up it a notch. Firstly, it depends on the language, but a lot of languages might actually help you with that. I, I forget the name of the publisher, but when I was learning French, and I was in the French learning section of um, some uh, like bookstores in France, I noticed that they had actually put aside special books that were written entirely in French and that could be enjoyed genuinely by a French speaker, but they had a little mark on them that said B1 or B2, you know? So you could read like the original Jules Verne of, you know, Around the World in 80 Days, which is something I read, I really enjoyed. But when I read that, I would not say that that was a C2 French book, you know? For as an, you would be able to totally enjoy that as an intermediate learner because of the level of complexity. So see how complex a book is. Um, and generally, if you want interesting reading materials in any language, I would ask a native speaker. Because native speakers can tell you. Like, if a native speaker asked me, oh, Benny, what should I read in English? and they, w they wanted to read intermediate level English, I would not suggest Charles Dickens to them. Because Charles Dickens can be very, very dense and very difficult to read, um, even as a native speaker. So I would think, okay, well, what other books do I like? What kind of books do they like? And talk it out and then I'd be like, oh, with that kind of genre, I'd say maybe this book will pique your interest. And the style they write is very easy. Um, I know, for instance, uh, if you guys know the writer Paulo Coelho, he wrote The Alchemist and a bunch of other books. I find his writing style to be very, very simple and straightforward. He has very short sentences. Um, he wrote originally in Portuguese, but I've read a lot of his books in other languages. I used um, one of his books, I think it was called Eleven Minutes uh, or Eleven Years. I, f I forget uh, the exact title. I read that in Italian. And I found it very simple to read, but this is still Paolo Coelho. He is an international best-selling author, and his stories have a lot of depth to them. So, you know, you can, uh, in that case, I was reading a translation, but sometimes if you find a good book with a good translation, that can still work. Um, but yeah, I would talk to native speakers, see what they recommend, see what style you like to read, and then give it a whirl. And something that isn't too heavy, but you can still keep your interest. There's so many excellent books out there that are written for, uh, that, that have like really deep stories, 
but they don't use super complex language. So you can still really get yourself in the story, you know? Okay, um, let's see. Next we have Eva. Eva Shipo, uh, Shipulova, if I got that right. Um, Hi, Benny. How can I learn the difference between the subjunctive and indicative in Spanish? I tried some literature, but I still struggle to understand. I, I feel your pain. I remember trying to uh, get my, wrap my head around this whole subjunctive thing when I was in, um, in Spain. And, oh God, all these explanations of, uh, you know, you have some, some kind of um, an emotional uh, doubt of, of the phrase. And I, I tried to think of it logically, but then I was like, oh, but hold on, if you say I think or I don't think, and like some of them, you could theoretically explain how the rule doesn't really work. And I find that, that logically um, following those rules, and as you said, the literature, the grammar explanations, it's not super handy in a lot of, a lot of cases. So I'll tell you what worked for me to learn the subjunctive in Spanish was just to learn phrases and know that that phrase is followed by the subjunctive. And I know it sounds very simplistic, but it is, is actually technically a little bit um, better in, in that it's consistent. Like you, you have um, wh whatever phrase, you, you, whatever like uh, thing comes before, like, I don't know, um, espero que. You, you have that and you just know that the next thing is going to be espero que haya, espero que tenga. And then uh, you, you, just, you just know espero que and then you, you learn a list of other verbs that uh, are likely to be followed with that and get a lot of practice in those phrases and start kind of switching between does this use the subjunctive or indicative. Again, if you, if you have a teacher Tell the teacher you're having problems with this thing and they will talk it through you, talk it through, through with you. And they may actually have good experience in uh, kind of not, not just giving you a list and saying, does it work here? Does it not work here? Because that's very artificial. A lot of teachers can actually be very good in uh, engineering a conversation such that you are forced to, uh, to use certain phrases and you have to think on the spot if this is going to use the subjunctive or whatever it may be. And then uh, they might tell you, oh, sorry, you got that wrong. And that's what you need to do. You need to get it wrong. You need to say it to a native speaker and have them correct you. Because I feel that that is, is a thousand times more powerful to help me remember something than it is to just see the rule. You know, me seeing the rule that if, there, if some doubt is implied, you will use the subjunctive is really not that memorable compared to me, say, me saying espero que tienes and then a native speaker saying Ooh, sorry you're supposed to say tengas then i'd be like oh I'm, I'm embarrassed and i have forgotten this thing and i thought i knew the rule and that that kind of emotional impact will burn it into your memory and you will not forget it so that's what i would suggest um to, to learn subjunctives and so on Okay, um, let's see. Stratos says hello from Greece and hello right back to you. Um, okay, Elise527 on YouTube says I'm starting a club on my language campus for people interested in learning languages. What materials, tools, or tips would you have for group language learning? Very good question. Okay, so for group language learning, um, I would say that. What you need is something that encourages conversation. Because um, I, I was a teacher, um, an English teacher. English is a second language many times. And what I saw my role as whenever I wanted to encourage a group of people to learn a language, um, I saw my role as language facilitator. So I didn't think that I was actually teaching the language. I didn't think that that was as um, effective because that's me talk, 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 and you zip it while you just listen to me. I'm talking at you and not actually communicating. What I would do as a language teacher, um, and what I would suggest you do for, um, like if you wanted to create, create group language learning, is create environments, set up games, 
and role plays and get the materials that would encourage groups of people to use the language together. You know, you might make it a game night. Maybe you want to play um, Mono Monopoly or, Cl or, or Cluedo or Clue, as they say in America, um, as your um, like game of choice. And you might find that in Spanish. Or um, you might play, like if there's only three or four of you, you might play a multiplayer computer game and just change the language setting to, to Spanish. Like, make it about some activity that everybody wants to do. You know, you don't want to force people into using, uh, into doing something that might be fun for you, but not for them. But something that people feel like is fun, and you just happen to do it in the language. So um, the mat materials would depend on the group of people and what you would enjoy, what they would enjoy. But I would try to get something like that that helps uh, encourage communication. Okay? So, uh, Gerardo says, Saludos desde Colombia. Hola. Okay. Anna says, interesting. Um, Pepper King says, what's the difference between high German and low German? Mm, I don't actually know that, to be honest. I um, know that they're two different dialects, but that is something I'm not sure of. So maybe somebody can uh, write an answer here in the comments. If you know... Yeah, this way. <laughs> if you know what the difference between high and low German is, then write it here so that Pepper King can see that, okay? Because um, I happen to, to not know. Okay, Huckleberry says, uh, what notes do you take when you're listening to a podcast? Okay, so um, if you're listening to a podcast and there's some recommended podcasts that I would tell people to watch, so um, James, maybe you can share the podcast link to the website for anyone who wants to kind of get listening practice. I have some favorite podcasts I, I have. You'll see a link come up in a second. Um, and the notes I would take, okay. Well, I would try to, because a podcast is a listening exercise, I wouldn't initially take that many notes, um, especially because the kind of podcasts I listen to, there, there tends to be a spoken part first, where it's a genuine, it's a conversation and there's no explanations. And I, I, I want to be just listening to that. I want to be seeing how much do I understand. I want to be completely 100% focused on processing that audibly. And uh, I mean, maybe one weakness I have is I can't uh, multitask. So I can't listen and write at the same time. That's just not a skill I ha that I have. Maybe you can, and maybe you can write and still have your attention on audio. But if you're like me and you can't really split your attention um, efficiently, then I would put 100% of your time into just listening. And then after, if it's a good learning podcast, then afterwards they're going to start explaining the words. And they're going to say, this means this, this means that. And generally what I do when I'm taking notes is I take notes for things that I feel like I can genuinely use these later. So they might explain an, an obscure word that is relevant to this particular conversation that's being had. And I'll hear them define it, and then I'll be like, um, yeah, okay, good to know, but I, I don't need to remember that, and I won't write it down. But then I'll hear them say a phrase that I'll be like, oh my god, I need to say that all the time, or I need to understand how to use this sentence. Then I will write that down, and the way I generally ten, uh, take my notes is um, like maybe in an Evernote, or if you like a pen and paper, write it down quickly while it's happening. And, com and then like do that in various different forms, like maybe you have notes from books and so on. And then at the end of the day or at the end of the week, I would go through my kind of chaotic mess of notes and I would open up an Excel file or a Google Sheet, anything like that. And I'll put the um, English and then target language in two different columns, export that, and I'll make another video uh, for you guys at some stage on my exact process but export that to Anki. And then I will um, be able to process it in, in Anki as flashcards. So that's my process, is I, I would listen to the podcast entirely, and then they'll have an explanation part at the end, and I would make notes in that explanation part for what I need to uh, remember, okay? So let's see what we have next. Um, okay. And then the other Shannon said, uh, what kind of language skills will I have after mastering all the levels in a particular app? Uh, I don't know. Uh, if you're asking me about particular apps that I don't have experience in, I, I can't answer that, sadly. 
Okay. Um, Ryan, Ryan uh, over on YouTube says, Hi Benny, how would you, if at all, approach joining online gaming communities to meet people in your target language if you're just starting out? Okay, well I've been, I've been dipping my toes in the water of uh, online gaming um, um, communities myself. I've been like testing that out. I'll be doing another couple of live gaming streams at some stage. And what I've learned is that you really do need to interact um, with people as much as you possibly can. So, for instance, um, you guys will remember that um, as I was looking through the comments here that like John Jonathan Higgins came up and he, I remember his name, especially, I've seen him in the community and stuff, but I remember his name because he's been joining me in these live chats and he's been asking questions and interacting with me. That means that I'll remember his name and I'll check out his live videos and see how he, how he does them. So that's kind of what you need to remember is you need to watch other people doing their live streams. And I, I'll, I'm, uh, it's a very interesting concept. I may actually show you how I watch live streams. It would be kind of like a um, live-ception where it's a live stream of live streams, meta thingy. Um, I, might, I might do that someday so you guys get a, a chance to figure that out. But if you watch other people's videos and you comment on them and you interact with them, they'll remember your name, they'll follow you, and they'll check out your stuff. So watch other people's videos, see what they're talking about, and comment on them. And there's loads of great live videos, regardless of if it's gaming or people talking about other things like I'm doing right now, and just uh, see how they're, how they're doing, okay? Um, so I hope that answers uh, that question. Okay. So Sean asked, what do you think of the Glasgow Mass Sentence Method? And I started using it, I think it's great. If you are getting great use out of it, that's fantastic. I'm very, very happy for you. I've uh, got a, pr a personal training from one of Glasgow's team members when I was in Taipei. And it's very, very effective, especially for both um, improving your recognition of the language, because you're gonna hear a lot of native spoken um, sentences. And also for um, making sure what you're saying is genuinely native because uh, one way our approaches are very opposing is that I kind of stumble my way up to fluency. I'll be like trying to speak and I'll make mistakes and I'll say something, I'll hang on to a mistake a little bit longer and then a teacher will drill out of me. Whereas with the Glasgow approach you have those mistakes, you, you never have those mistakes in the content you learn because they're drilled out of you from the, the start. The catch is that it is um, it, it doesn't allow for as many mistakes. It does it makes you feel that you can't make those kinds of mistakes, and that's why I I didn't jive with it perfectly myself in some of the ways I learned it. But there are many people who have told me that it has made a world of difference in their language learning story. So if you're learning from it and you're finding it useful, then I would say keep it up. You know, definitely. And uh, Mike, who runs the Glasgow, he's a, he's a good friend of mine, very smart guy, definitely knows his stuff. So I, I definitely recommend it, okay? Uh, so I've got a question about learning standard dialect of Arabic versus uh, specific dialects. Okay, um, I actually made a whole video about that. So I'm not gonna get into that uh, here, but if you search my YouTube channel, I did a whole discussion on that. I'm uh, personally, I would, I mean, in short, if you want to speak with people, learn one of the dialects, specifically the dialect of the people you want to speak with. If you want to pass exams, have an academically recognized Arabic, yeah, you have to study modern standard Arabic. But for the purposes I tend to learn languages, I would always opt for the dialect first, okay? So, um, Dahi says, Hola, soy un irlandés fuera de su isla in Madrid. Hola, otro irlandés. Okay. Um, Tara says, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, okay. Shannon says, how do I find someone to speak with on WhatsApp? Um, that's an interesting question. I've never used WhatsApp as a language learning tool. Um, generally with WhatsApp, I would only contact people who, whose phone numbers I have. Um, so if uh, anyone here knows how to use WhatsApp for language learning, then just write a comment and maybe uh, you will help uh, Shannon out with that. 
generally, the um, there are other apps that I would recommend. Uh, I know uh, probably the one I go that my go to one it would be Hello Talk, which is an app that does let you connect in chat, kind of like WhatsApp, uh, directly with people who uh, are there specifically for learning a language. So that's what I would say. Okay, you're welcome uh, to see people who've been thanking. Uh, so just a. Uh, Quick reminder, I'm doing this till uh, 6 o'clock my local time, so that's 20 minutes from now. If you're watching this um, afterwards or if you just caught up here and you're thinking, oh no, I missed the start, then I will remind you to make sure to subscribe, whether that's to YouTube, uh, Facebook, you can see um, underneath me I got the um, names of places. Uh, so make sure you subscribe and make sure to click the bell icon if you have any of the apps installed, that bell icon will mean you'll get a little ping because I'm going to do some of them scheduled. And if you want to know ahead of time, definitely when it's scheduled, uh, join my email list. So again, fluentintreemonths.com at the bottom and join the email list and you will get notified of what the upcoming Hangouts are. So you know ahead of time which ones you might be interested in because I'm going to do themed ones. They're not all going to be general language learning questions and answers like this one. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that very quickly. All right, so next question. Um, well, Theo says, great idea to do a live video. Thank you very much for that. Okay, Tao Nui says, um, hello, Benny. I have tried to learn, I've tried to relearn my French for a number of years, and I always start strong, but after a few weeks, I hit a wall and start to fall off in my learning. Do you have any tips to break through and continue with it? Um, I, I hinted at this uh, a little bit uh, a few minutes ago when I was saying that to get over a plateau, I get stuck at plateaus myself, regardless of whether you're relearning, getting into it, um, you know, getting your momentum up and back and so on. But what you need to do is start over again uh, with something completely different. If what you're doing now is not having you progress, change your approach. Maybe you need to speak more. Maybe you need to study more. Maybe you need to read more. Maybe you need to listen more. Maybe what you're listening to isn't effective. Maybe the people you're speaking to, you're having monotonous conversations and you need to find new language speaking partners. So change it and see how it helps. But keep in mind that when you do switch to something else, you're not going to suddenly feel this burst of, oh, wow, I'm progressing very quickly again. Because there are many things that you, need, that you do that are very useful to help you progress in a language, but that unfortunately, we're are going to make you very, feel very stupid. So I would rate it not necessarily just on what you feel is is uh, helping necessarily, what you feel is uh, making you feel smarter, but what you feel is forcing you to progress. And sometimes, ironically, that's the thing that makes you feel stupider. So just keep that in mind. Okay, uh, we've got some generic questions. What's the best way to learn X language? I, I won't be able to answer those kind of questions. I need people to be specific in why they're learning a language, um, what they're learning a language for, if they're, if they're planning to travel to the country. Um, and I want to try to answer as many of these questions as I can. And if I miss your question, then feel free to um, make, just make sure you're subscribed and you'll catch me next time. And you'll be one of these first questions because generally the first questions I do get through um, pretty much all of them and the later ones I have to flick through. So if you can keep putting your questions in here and I will get through as many of them as I can, but I'm gonna start skipping questions pretty soon, okay? Um, but don't worry, I'm still here for 15 minutes. So um, Aiden, uh, Aiden Giordano over on YouTube says, how do you not get similar languages mixed up? Okay, good question. Um, I would say, uh, firstly, you, um, you need to make sure you study one language at a time. If uh, there are people who could study multiple ones, I'm not one of them, and I, a lot of people I know would not be able to do this. Uh, so study one language until you get it to a solid level. Generally, I, I recommend B2. This is um, upper intermediate, where you are socially equivalent to the target language. You can get tests to confirm this. So study the, the language until you are that level and then you could start another language and I feel like there will be a, a little bit of interference but it's not going to go down. So the mistake I made initially after I'd learned a little Spanish I moved to Italy 
My Spanish was not excellent. It was maybe A2, perhaps B1 at best. Um, I moved to Italy. I started learning Italian. And to be honest, I my Italian kind of started replacing my Spanish. And uh, it's because my Spanish wasn't at a very solid level. And I had to kind of relearn Spanish as a result of that. So I would say learn one language to a very good level and then keep maintaining that, but change your focus to the next language. So as a quick answer, that's what I would say. Okay, so back to Facebook, we have Naomi who says, um, I'm in Montreal learning French, but I feel stuck because mo pe most people in public speak my first language and have little patience for my French. How do you construct interesting conversations as a beginner in a language? Okay, uh, this is like a multi-level thing because I, I feel you're not just asking how do you make the conversations interesting because that's a lot of pressure on you. That's, that's kind of suggesting you have to be this entertainer, you know, you like gather around everybody while I, I make balloon animals and, and, and that's, that's a lot of pressure and that's just going to make you feel even more intimidated. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily think of it as how do you make interesting conversations. I would think how can you be in situations where you are likely to keep people's attention. So that's slightly different because one way is the kind of people you're hanging out with. Now I did live in Montreal and I know that there are loads of people who um, like the majority of people you'll meet definitely speak English there. But I also know that there were like three types of people that I would meet, uh, to kind of say it broadly. One would be the native English speakers who, um, let's say they, they, either speak, they either speak French or they don't speak French, um, but they, they want to, they're more likely to want to speak English. So that's not ideal. And I wouldn't, I would try to not hang out with those during my intensive learning process. But out of the French speakers, there would be people who, um, who like their, their French speaker, they speak English and they kind of, they, they're happy to speak English. They like speaking English. They would um, jump at the chance. They're like, oh wow, you're a foreigner. Let me talk to you in English. But then the final group is the group that I would seek out, the kind of people I would try to spend time with. And that's the group of people that actually did not like speaking English. So I <laughs> uh, don't want to get political or anything, but you know, you might like find people who are like separatist. They're like, you know, free Quebec and all this, and no, nothing starting by Canada, and don't want to talk about that at all. And like, I'm not political in minded in these things, but I would find people like that specifically because it would mean that they, when when I say when I would say to them, and, and they might think to, they might think, oh, okay, I'm gonna have to speak English with this guy, or maybe he'd prefer that I speak English. When I told them, uh, no, actually, I don't want to speak English ever. This whole summer that I'm intensively learning French, I only want to speak French. The, their faces would light up, you know? They'd be like, oh wow, this is great. This guy really wants to uh, speak French. And even though my French was not fantastic, when I got there, it was, uh, that's the summer I feel like I really pushed my level up in French because of how much practice I got. They loved it and they were very patient to help me because they knew that if I made the switch uh, back to um, uh, English that I might lose my, my momentum. So think of the kind of people you're hanging out with and then that's kind of a very very much a deciding factor. And in other words, um, to keep the conversations interesting, keep in mind a lot of this is just how you interact with people. And if you're hesitating and this whole kind of Jack Sparrow, you know, if you, if you say something like, je veux du petit. You know, you, you kind of keep them in suspense and, and think of that as different to uh, saying, uh, je uh, veux, um, oh, 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 what was the word? Oh, I forget. Oh, no. What was it again? And, and like the, you would be hesitating the same amount of time, but essentially the second version is more awkward because of how you, you're kind of showing people your lack of confidence. So by doing a different thing like that, um, people might be inclined to switch to English for that reason and not necessarily the thing you're talking about. Um, and this is something people will forget a lot of the time. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, we're down to 10 minutes. So I'm gonna start skipping questions through um, 
my list here and I'm very sorry if I didn't get to your question. Again, if you're subscribed, click the notification and you will see me do these things and then you'll be one of the first people and you'll put your same question that I might have missed and I will get to it uh, first then. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, going down, Ordi S. Ham says bonjour, okay, bonjour. Uh, <laughs> and then people are chatting to one another, that's great to see here, okay. Um, all right, Gregory says, hola Benny, I'm studying Spanish and I always feel my written Spanish is far stronger than spoken. I feel like I can't remember vocab when I'm speaking, any tips or exercises I can do. Um, generally, very simply, whatever you do the most practice in is what you're going to be doing the best in. So if your written Spanish is stronger and you feel like you can't remember when you're speaking, what a lot of people would do in that situation is they would gravitate towards even more written and even less spoken because they feel good when they're doing the written version or, the, uh, or reading the, the language and they feel bad when they do the spoken version. So the main tip I would say is you have to reverse the amount of focus you're giving. If you are doing 90% reading and writing and 10% speaking and listening, that needs to switch. You need to do more time because that frustration doesn't magically go away. You can't, there's no tip I can give you that'll just magically make it all disappear. But what will change is through practice. So make that spoken part the core, or at least listening, and trying to keep up and interact with uh, people as much as you can. And that will change it. And then otherwise, if you're specifically not able to remember vocabulary, and you need to produce it on the spot, then look into mnemonics. So the website Memrise, that's M-E-M-R-I-S-E dot -E com, uh, has some really quirky mnemonics. And I, I find if... Uh, uh, you know, if I if there's a word I really need to know and I know I need to use it and I keep forgetting it, I would just think of a really good mnemonic. So then the moment would come and I need to say it and I'd be like, oh, give me a second. And I would think, what, what was the mnemonic again? And then I have the word. And the great thing is you only need to do that like a couple of times to, to rely on the mnemonic. And it kind of acts as glue to stick that to your memory. And then it just comes out of your mouth naturally as you're speaking. So... That's what I would say. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Great point. Glad you guys are enjoying my, my answers today. Um, and answering one another. Yeah. If you've seen a question someone else has asked that you know the answer to, then absolutely feel free to, um, to write it out and, uh, you know, give your language learning tips in the side here. Because uh, this is a chance for you guys to interact with one another. It's not just about me. This is uh, the community that can help one another. I want to make sure you guys are aware of that. Always, always, you see someone who has a question you think you know the answer to. Um, always feel like you, you can jump in. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. We've got just over five minutes left. And I'm, gonna, I'm still skipping past some questions here. Again, very sorry if I missed your question. Just make sure you're uh, getting notifications and I will definitely see it first next time. Um, okay. Mm. Right. Yeah, great, seeing people answering other people's questions, talking about my subjunctive discussions from a few minutes ago. Uh -huh. And uh, Eva answered the question about um, uh, German being spoken in uh, the south of Germany versus in the uh, highlands and, and lowlands and pronunciation. Thank, thank you for answering that question. Uh, okay. And we've got lots of people writing uh, um, interesting questions and just uh, encouragement in other languages. So appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Uh, when I was talking about gaming, Eva, t Eva replies with, with Russian gamers, you won't learn much daily Russian, only swear words. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. We got a question on YouTube from Chris 
who is writing up to us from his actual fluency account. So, hello Chris. Um, and he says, what would your ideal online language course look like if it had to take you from absolutely nothing to intermediate in a language? Um, what types of content would it have? Which would it definitely not? Okay, so an online course. Um, well, as you know, the course that I made, the language hacking course, would be what I would imagine a course would look like. And if you were changing it to be online, um, I would try to make it interactive because that's the thing is when I was writing the language hacking books, I needed to make them work as books. So I needed to engineer everything with that as the most ideal way of doing it. And there are definitely advantages of using like fixed books like that. But if you're making an online course version, I would say that you want to make it interactive. You know, you want to maybe, for instance, have multiple choice questions that people can actually click and then that will send them in a particular direction. It will note what their weaknesses are and the course would be dynamic and it would actually adapt with how they're learning and send them in one way versus send them in, sending them in another because that's the advantage of online is this kind of way of adjusting how people are um, how they're learning in, in that context, whereas a book can't change that. So that's kind of a quick answer I would give to that. Okay, let's see. Last, uh, f last just four minutes. So, um, sorry that I'm skipping a lot of your questions here. And I, I promise I'm gonna keep doing as many of these as I can until I get to as many of your questions. And I am also going to mix it up, so to give you guys fair warning, I am doing a lot of these general Q&As because I'm also going to do live hangouts that I'm going to allow myself to discuss specific themes, specific languages, continue showing you guys the books that I have, and even a couple of live gaming sessions every now and again. So that way, uh, you know, I can t we can talk about specific things, and uh, that's why I'm doing these general ones. I want to, I want like the community community to kind of release the tension that they have from all these questions bundled up inside of them they can let that go and then when I come back they will be uh, I won't be talking about learning advanced French and then somebody will be like buddy how do I learn Russian you know so <laughs> that's why I do it these um, live um, general Q&A's as much as I can uh, okay, so Tom says, Gia Gitch, Benny. That's a uh, hello, Benny, uh, to those who would know. What course did you study in college? I'm thinking about studying either French or Japanese with business. Any thoughts? Okay, I studied electronic engineering with no language um, side to it at all. I actually tried to study Spanish in the evenings. They offered a Spanish evening course, and I wasn't able to get into it, even though I, th I tried three times, three different years to get into it. Um, so one thing I would say is I am not a huge fan of how a lot of places teach languages in university and schools and I'm trying to change that. So because of that I don't know if that's the most ideal way for you to be learning French or Japanese. I would say if business is the thing you want to learn you might want to focus on that and then potentially move to uh, France or Japan and you could have an Erasmus year in France with a, a purely business course. I think that might actually be a little bit more beneficial. It's not a lot more beneficial. Um, and yeah, so like I, I would try to make your language learning more of an immersive thing if possible and just decide ahead of time some year you're going to go to the country. Okay. And um, okay, I think I've gotten up to uh, about the last 15 minutes of uh, the questions here so I'm sorry I didn't get to any questions that were written in the last 15 minutes but thank you very much everybody really appreciate you uh, joining in on these and especially to those of you who've been uh, checking out these live Q&A's for the last month and uh, sticking it through while I had technical difficulties until these days when I can do it nice and smoothly you know, it's great. I, I can look back on, on uh, what I've learned, you know, and like I always tell people, get the mistakes out of your system because you, you see today was actually a very good live Q&A session. I found your questions really interesting 
Um, I love how you've been interacting with one another and uh, helping each other out. Uh, so it's been great to do this and uh, I'm just flicking through these questions uh, seeing that you guys are saying thanks and that you'll check out stuff that's great uh, so yeah appreciate you guys all coming and seeing what I had to say here and yeah okay so thanks everybody and once again make sure to click the uh, subscribe button if you just happen to catch this Make sure to click the bell icon because I do several live Q&As without any warning. I would just say, I feel like doing a live Q&A right now. I've got an hour to kill. I'll do it. And then whoever happens to see it will see it. And you will see it if you have a notification, then your phone will buzz. You'll be able to come in, be one of the first people to ask me a question. And then as you saw at the start, I can those first questions, I can answer those very thoroughly. I'm like you know giving those guys five whole minutes of like my deepest darkest secrets to answer those questions so you you know you get your question in first and you'd be surprised how um how much i can get through uh, those initial questions make sure you get that uh otherwise uh check out the website and all the links that you see below and you can follow what i do on other places follow the youtube channel Check out the email list and it'll tell you what other live Q&As we're doing at a time. And thanks so much everyone for checking this out. It's been great to see you guys. And we'll be in touch and I will see you during the next live Q&A. Happy language learning everyone.